Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another episode of Everyday Stories by Ade Tunde Dada. My name is Tunde, and today we have a very special guest. Now, you can usually find him on the streets of New York City, documenting people who he refers to as street unicorns. Or you can find him taking headshots of your favorite celebrities. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today we will be speaking with a award-winning New York-based photographer, Robbie Quinn. <laughs> As he puts it, <laughs> from Bon Jovi, <laughs> to models, to CEOs. <laughs> he enjoys making people look like the bad ass, the bad ass that they are. So, Robbie, <laughs> let's get on. For right. the two or three people in the back that do not know who you are, please introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Robbie Quinn, I'm a photographer. Uh, based in New York City in the Manhattan area. Mm -hmm. And I uh, am working on a book called Street Unicorns, where I celebrate uh, diversity and inclusion through people with bold personal style. Awesome, 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 awesome. So before we talk more about Robbie Quinn, the photographer, Let's go back into your past <laughs> and talk about Robbie Quinn, the keyboard player for the hard rock band, The Score. <laughs> and so <laughs> I just wanted to know, how did you end up being a member of a hard rock band? Your audio might be out. Okay, all right, I'll go way back. We have an hour. Uh People might be interested in a tidbit or two. Sure. Uh, let's see. When I was, uh, when I was a, a young lad, my parents bought me a very small, it was about that big of um, a keyboard musical. And um, when I misbehaved, they would send me to my room. And in retaliation, I would turn the volume all the way up and I'd just bang on it. Just like to let them know my dissatisfaction with my penalty of being sequestered into the bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, through that, uh, I, I, I got pretty good. And uh, eventually they purchased a, a larger keyboard for me. Mm -hmm. And then they wanted to... Um, have me play the organ at church, which I was like, well, this is good. I get out of sitting with everybody else. I can just play. And which, you know, cause I really didn't want to hear what was going on anyway. I just wanted to play music. Mm -hmm. And uh, there would be a part in this, in the service where the music would dip down low, kind of like an Elvis song or something. Mm. And the, the, the priest would come up and he would he would talk and he would say when when I was hungry you fed me when I needed shelter you brought me and he'd go on you didn't know how long he was going to just riff for so you knew you just had to keep playing something down low and it was always in minor mm -hmm. and so I decided to play a Moody Blues song, which is an old rock band. And I would play a song called Nights in White Satin, which at the time I was only like about 13. I thought it was about um, finely dressed men in horses, on horses, you know, knights in white satin. But it was really about, you know, knights in white satin, you know, just people getting it on. And, uh, and, and but, I don't know. I was like, oh, I'm going to hell. But uh, but then I met some guys from school and they were playing music too. And so we all 
brought our instruments into somebody's garage and we play and, and we play in high school bands, like not, not with the high school, but like we play at like house parties and things like that and neighbors homes. And, um, we had a good time. And then eventually we worked our way up into playing the clubs, uh, and, and that was good. And then we played colleges. We got on the radio. We, we started writing songs right away. Right away, we were like, well, we want to write our own songs. We want to uh, be, uh, be like the Beatles or something. And uh, we, we started playing a few, uh, in a few different states in the United States, in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania and New York. Delaware, all in the Northeast area of, of the States. And um, a lot of record companies were showing interest, but our, we were, we didn't have enough maturity and we had too much ego and we, we fought and uh, that was the end of the band. And I had been playing in the band. I didn't, I was very fortunate. I didn't have to do anything else for, probably about 10 years. And, um, and so I was like, well, what am I going to do now? And, and sadly through the whole time, I, I can't sing. I was only playing the piano and I was, so I was always reliant on somebody else mm -hmm. to get this creative spirit out. Yeah. And so I was like, well, I, I just can't do this anymore. And, uh, I moved to Florida all the way at the bottom of the United States. Yeah. And um, I figured, well, you know, if I'm not going to be in a band, I might as well be warm because if I'm going to be poor, I don't want to be cold and poor. So moved to Florida and uh, just tried different jobs. Uh, I worked at a newspaper for a little bit and learned about not only advertising, but uh, I learned about uh, laying out the ad. and. I had no idea that I would ever be a photographer at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were in the band, we had our photos taken and I was interested in that. Uh, I had always taken photos, but it was just kind of a, a thing you did. It wasn't really anything serious. Hmm. And um, then when I was down in Florida, um, somehow I just like lucked into working at this job as a concert promoter. There was already a company that was a concert promotion company and I went to work for them and um, uh, did well with it. Uh, it was a large company. They had uh, over a hundred offices mm -hmm. and I worked my way up and I was in charge of about 10 of them. And um, then the company sold and all of a sudden all of my accounts wanted me to have my own company. So I did. And then uh, I found myself, I had this big company putting on concerts and um, that was great. Uh, through it, I, um, I we, we would have show programs that were handed out at the event and I learned more about laying out ads and pictures and just how to use negative space and make things look great. And um, then I want I, I, I was really sad all the, through this whole time. I was, I was making a lot of money putting on big concerts, but I wasn't being creative in the way that really satisfied me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got this idea if I'm putting on concerts, maybe I can manage a band. And um, there are a couple acts that I started working with. And one of them was a country act. And I was, got them on the radio. I got them to open up in front of crowds of thousands of people. And I was like, well, you've gone as far as you can go in Florida. You need to go to Nashville and Nashville, Tennessee being the big country music capital of the world. And I was never really in the country music, but this is what the act was doing. And I um, got them set up in Nashville and I went for a visit 
And I was like, wow, this is a great city. I just want to like be here. There's college. Florida, for anybody that doesn't know, is just filled with old retired people. And I, I just like, I can't, I can't live here uh, for any length of real time. And so I went to Nashville, <clears throat> a great place. And excuse me. And my iced coffee. <laughs> I, I always drink coffee with ice. No matter what time of year it is. Wow. Um, so I'm in Nashville, putting on concerts. Uh, well, I'm still putting on concerts, but uh, that kind of fell to the wayside. I really wanted to do artist management. I figured I can manage all of these salespeople putting on concerts. Why can't I manage just a few artists? And um, I was terrible at it. I, I thought I'd be good, but I was terrible. But along the way, they needed photos and i was like well you know uh, i i can take photos you know I, I hired some photographers but i was looking at their work and i was like you know i i can i can do this i can do enough mm. just to get somebody in the right direction yeah and then at that time myspace was really a big thing if, you, if anybody's ever remembers myspace yeah. they, i think you're I think your great grandparents used MySpace. I don't know. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'm, I would take photos and I put them up on MySpace to promote them, and then all of a sudden, my um, my assistant would get phone calls and from record producers, other artists, and and uh, they'd say, "Who's the photographer?" And you're like, well, that was me. And they're like, well, we want to hire you. And I'm like, How much? And I say, hold on. Somebody wants to pay me to take photos. Um, and I would just say whatever number. And they'd hire me. And it was great. Wow. And uh, three or four months went by. And all of a sudden, I hadn't done anything except take photos. And I was like, I like this. This is the first time since I've played music that I really felt creative. Mm. And I was always shooting everybody like it was an album cover. Long, long time ago, people had albums. And uh, us old folks, we would like look at the albums as we listen to music and we would open them and we'd read the lyrics and we'd learn who played what songs and everything. And, and so whenever I was taking a photo of the people I was managing, I'd shoot it like it was an album cover. Mm -hmm. And then whoever the record producers and other managers and uh, artists that came, I would shoot it like an album cover. Mm -hmm. And that stays with me now. And um, uh, an album cover is not too different than a magazine cover. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you just want everybody to look like a hero. And, and so, uh, let's see, I... Uh, I was putting on concerts and I was managing, but it was just not as interesting to me as photography. And mm -hmm. Well, this is what I really want to do. And so I just uh, started just getting out of the business that uh, any businesses I was in, I would, I let all the employees know, look, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. You need to go look for other jobs. And I just did everything I could to concentrate on photography and I shot every kind of photography you could. I did, I did weddings. I shot food. I took photos of people that are in business, which I still do because it, uh, they, you know, they, uh, something needed. It's still portrait photography, which is really what I consider myself a portrait photographer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, I, anything that would come at me, I would take photos of, and uh, it became a full-time job. And then along the way, I started being able to be more selective about what I wanted to shoot. And, um, and then I got a, a couple of inquiries to come work in New York. And uh, I was born near JFA, JFK Airport, it's somebody out there listening even knows where JFK airport is it's in New York. Can Google it. And um and and so I 
came to visit New York and take some photos and I just felt like I was home. You know, it's like I knew I was born here and New York is really, for me, I feel like it's where the whole world comes together into one place. And that's exciting to me because it means that we have an opportunity to learn from each other and um, and like no other place. And uh, where I was in Nashville, it's a wonderful place. People were really nice, but it was all just like, it was like having only one channel on your radio, you know, yeah. it's like, uh, doesn't work. And he, and yeah. And here in New York, you could be on the subway and you look around and you could hear 15 different languages. And, and that was just, it was just exciting for me. And, um, I had considered moving to Los Angeles on the West coast in California. And, um, it, it was enticing because it's really nice weather there. And, um, you know, it's Hollywood and, uh, I don't know that would, that would have been great, but it's kind of glamorous and New York is more grit and I like the grit it's real, you know, and not that there's some reality in LA, but, um, in New York, it's, if, if people don't like you, they say, I don't like you. Or if they like you, they say, um, if you need something, call me and you can call them at three in the morning and they'll be there. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, straightforward. It's, yeah. It's very straightforward. That's, that, that's good work. Um, so, um, so decided to come up here. It's been about five years and it has changed my life through it. It's brought, um, opportunities to, to travel, all around the world, uh, not as much of the world as I really want. You know, I, I'm really, um, uh, you know, I, I've been to a lot of countries. Sadly, there is a continent that I have not really been to yet. Which the one closest, is that? The closest I ever got to your continent was at an airport in Morocco. And that was it. I just like a little layover. Wow. And and there's this whole other world. Definitely. I have so many I have a, a whole lot of Instagram friends uh throughout the continent. And uh I get in, invitations. Um you know, I uh, I don't think I'm talking yet a turn here. I was just uh was, since you and I talk, mm -hmm. uh and you know you're in the capital. Yes. And, and I and I and I was asking Josiah, like, well, where are you from? And he was he told me the name of his town. It's only about three miles north of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you know Joss. And yes. I don't, know, Joss. I don't know if that's the way you say it. Yes, but, Joss. Um, but you know, um, and and uh, he said, well, you know, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go visit in a little while. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you want to come with me. And I said, oh, that'd be fantastic. You should. I, I really would love to. I, I'm really thinking there's the timing. I, I think I will eventually. That's mm -hmm. timing right now with uh, the of pandemic. Course. Of course, of course. Yeah, that and, you know, all the, I really feel for you, all the stuff that's going on. I think it's mainly in, in uh, Lago. Yeah, uh, but it's, it's, it's mainly in Lagos, but you can feel it all over the country. Right. And the president is actually here in the capital. So, like, sure. it's definitely here. <laughs> right. But not right. as much as Lagos. You know, so I was, I was really, um, you know, concerned. Like, when uh, I, I didn't know when you had asked me to uh, get on with you here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what the what the situation was like how how safe it is and you know i i started doing some reading and um about the conditions there and you know i i really have been largely ignorant uh, 
and most Americans are in there. Uh, you know, they're just odd. You know, it, it, there there is this whole this whole perception, like, okay, yeah, New York is where the whole world comes together. Mm -hmm. But New York is not the whole world. Of course. And of course. And but a lot of Americans kind of think it might be, you know, and it's yeah. like they, most of them have never traveled. They just, they're very isolated. In a bubble and, in a way. Right. Right. Exactly. And yeah. and I really um, coming here and talking to people that is, oh yeah, I just got here from, you know, uh, Taiwan or I just got here from it had made me want to go visit, you know, mm -hmm. Slovakia or Barcelona or, you know, um, India. I was in Mumbai last year. It was a wonderful experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like, uh, you know, what I had been, I, I, I feel like what I'm wanting to say with photography now is is mainly about diversity diversity and inclusion mm -hmm. and inclusion meaning that that we're all humans and that regardless of whether or not um, we're from this country or we look this way or we look that way or however we identify as humans uh, and I know this is it, from what I understand, at least an issue uh, where yeah. you are is whether yeah. or not somebody that might want to identify um, as a different sex than they were born with, or if somebody is, uh, you know, just happened to be born a woman, that uh, a woman is still a human, and definitely, a human, definitely, and humans have rights mm. and. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's a challenge that I think we should be way past. And, and sadly, you know, still we're not. working towards it. Yeah. You know, it's, um, hmm. um, I, yeah, I, I, I really feel like whatever I can do as mm -hmm. a photographer mm -hmm. to, um, to celebrate and to share other people's stories, basically to, uh, I would say, just lift them up mm -hmm. and, and have their experiences inspire other people mm -hmm. that, to let them know they're not alone. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, been, it's been wonderful because of the internet. Definitely. Because because of the internet, somebody like you and I find each other. Yes. And, um, but I'll have people that will have been feeling like they can't be their most authentic self somewhere else in the world. And then they'll see uh, a post where I've um, uh, amplified the voice of somebody mm -hmm. else. And they're like, I get what they are doing, and I have a commonality with that. Mm. And and I think what it's done is that when there where there's countries that maybe not be getting along, like for instance, uh, for the United States and Russia, or the United States and China, that yep. you know that um, that we're not we're really we're best of friends. friends. We're not best of friends, right? <laughs> It's, it's really that the leaders aren't the best of friends. The people, Therefore, yeah. the, the people, they find each other and they're like, you know what? We're, I feel the same way you do. Or mm -hmm. I, uh, and, and we're realizing that, you know, for the large part, well, in, in its entirety, mm -hmm. humans are humans. We all mm -hmm. feel the same thing. We're all looking to um, achieve some of the same things and we all in general we want love and and we want happiness and we 
We want peace on earth. Everybody wants peace on earth. The only people that don't seem to want to have peace on earth yeah. are people in charge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Interesting. And, and, and so, you know, I've tried to share um, some of the majority of the people I photograph are in New York. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I've photographed people in London and uh, in Slovakia and uh, Budapest and um, Australia and everywhere I can go, like I said, in Mumbai. And, um, and you know, it, it, the more diversity that I can show, the more commonality that I hope to bring together that people will um, make an effort not only to not only to be their most authentic selves, but more importantly, to appreciate and accept anybody that's different than themselves. Mm-hmm. Because we're not really different. We're all human. All human. That's the yeah. human. Yeah. And so um actually you answered I was gonna ask you like several questions from sure, sure. I'm, um I'm sorry. <laughs> after? I no, it's cool. I think is that you've kind of answered <laughs> a lot of them as you were talking. <laughs> but um, let, let me, um, so you being a photographer now, right? And so essentially it's safe to say that there won't be a follow-up album to the good, the bad, and the ugly by the score. It's safe to say that's kind of well, Oh, you, you found it, huh? <laughs> wow, you found that. You know, uh, let me tell you the story behind that. Um, that's wonderful that you were able to track that down. Uh, so yeah, the, the band is in existence. We're, we're, um, we're playing, uh, the infamous, there's a big famous club called CBGB in New York city. We played Mm -hmm. there, we played big venues, opened up for acts and everything. And we were like really close to getting a record contract. And, uh, and then it all fell apart. Fast, and then I left, and, and fast forward, um, I'm gonna say, oh, at least 15 years. And by this time, I'm in, uh, I had already left Florida and I'm in Nashville. A guy that used to play bass with us calls me up out of the blue, I haven't talked to him in years. And he says, hey, there's a guy that wants to sign the band. And I'm like, what band? And he goes, our band. I'm like, we don't have a band. We haven't had a band in in 15 years. And um, he says, well, you know, he wants to talk to you. And I said, oh, all right. So because I I was one of the writers of the band, the bass player, he was kind of more or less a... uh, um, I mean, he was in the band, but he was, he wasn't one of the main songwriters. Yeah. Yeah. And so he gives me the guy's information. The guy calls, uh, I call the guy up and, uh, I can't even remember his name, but, uh, I said, um, what's this about? And he says, I want to sign the band and we're going to have a, a, um, a big concert. And I'm like, big concert. We don't, the band doesn't exist. It hasn't existed in 15 years. And, and we're old now. What do you want us to go out on with little walkers on stage? We're not the Rolling Stones. Only they can do that. <laughs> and um, and he, uh, he says, no, no, no. He says, what I do is I put the album together and, and then for some reason, your music, which was a while back, people in Europe are still into it. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. He says, what do you have? And I said, all we have is like old demo tapes. It wasn't an album or anything. These were like just our our demos, if you know what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a demo. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I said, I can send you the demos. He, He says, have a photo. And I'm like, yeah, I can find a photo of the band. And he said, okay. And so I sent him the demos. I, it, but first of all, I said to him, I said, how much money do you want? 
And he goes, no, I don't want any money. I figured it was a con artist. You know? Yeah. Goes, no. And sure enough, I sent him the picture, the pictures in the demo and he puts it all together and somehow it ends up on the internet. And uh, a month or two later, get a big check in the mail. And I don't know, people in Europe are buying music that nobody listens to anymore. <laughs> oh, wow. No offense to the people in Germany and France, but of thanks. course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so that went on for a while, and I would split up the money, and we all, we didn't make a lot of money, but you know, we were able to pay a couple of bills with it, maybe your power bill, and mm -hmm. it was good. Um, so, and, and, you know, it was a little bit of satisfaction that even though the band had imploded and we never realized what we probably could have been, uh, it was nice to see that it, it got out there. And, um, uh, so, yeah. You never know there could be a, a reunion, you know, you guys could do like, a, no, oh, oh. We, you know, the big so the band ended, uh, it, was, it ended pretty ugly, uh, but, uh, and, and again, it was, we were just, we were young, we were immature. Yeah. But after some years had gone by, uh, you know, we started talking to each other again, and I had been making a trip up north, and we decided, yeah, let's have a reunion and get together. And, and um, we met at one of my friend's house that was in the band, and the other members came over. And uh, we, we've done that a few times. And it's nice. we uh, have some drinks and we laugh and uh, we, we basically talk about what we would have and could have and should have done, whose fault it was. And then we laugh because it really, at this point, you know, we've all moved on. Yeah. And uh, yeah. But it was definitely. I, I'm in retrospect. I was just going to say, in retrospect, it's it's really uh, I'm I'm glad the way it worked out. I think uh, at the particular time when we had the band, I was living a pretty uh, risky life, you know, I was, as people in bands do. And yeah. uh, I, I, if we had continued, I don't know if I'd be here now. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no, you you, you would have. You would have. And well, the other thing is, is that again, like I couldn't sing and, and, and this was funny. Um, I always wanted to sing. I would have wanted to be Mick Jagger, mm. but you know, I just, you know, I played the piano and that, that that's what I could do. Um, and so I felt limited with the way I could express myself creative, uh, creatively mm. and and it was like magic when I picked up the camera. I, I, you know, I, I had had earlier conversations with people about photography. You know, I had this business putting on concerts and I had all these employees and having these employees work for me. And, you know, I would set it all up, but they were the ones doing the work. But I could sit on the beach and I'd pick up, pick up my phone and say, how much money did we make today? And that, that's that's all I had to do. It was. Uh, wow. that's, that's a nice, yeah, a nice gig. <laughs> it was a very nice gig, but I wasn't doing anything creative. Mm. And and you know, um, I have the luxury, you know, um, that you know, we're. Um, I I have to not take it for granted that you know we're. Uh, living in an area that has lots of opportunities and uh, mm -hmm. very grateful for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it does afford somebody to be able to do something creative and still make a living. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd been in the band, I started putting on concerts, managing acts, but the managing acts, you know, it, I wasn't really getting the creativity out. Mm -hmm. And when I picked up the camera to take photos, you know, I was just initially doing it to save some money. But it was like something magic. All of the years of looking at album covers, um, 
Oh, and there was something else I used to do when I was a kid. A lot of kids do this. You're, you'd get a magazine and you'd see somebody's face in the magazine and you'd write a little bubble and you'd make a little funny caption, you know, <laughs> what you pretend they're saying, you know, like make a cartoon out of somebody's mm -hmm. photo in a magazine. Just childish, you know, I might have only been 10 years old when I was doing it, but I was like, I would somehow formulate that there was a story going on with a photo and I would make my own story. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I think that with ad layouts and with looking at album covers, that as soon as I put the camera in my hand, things just started happening. Some mm -hmm. people would say, you know, are you going to be a photographer? And I'd say, well, well photography, it, it's a really stupid business. Why would you do that? Because you can't scale that business. You can't really make a lot of money with it. But I didn't really care. You know, I had made money and I wasn't very happy uh, doing that. I, it, this Being able to express yourself, I think that that is paramount. And, and I, and when I see people expressing themselves with their style, I feel like I have a connection with them because they finally have come to a point as I have that being your most authentic self is the most important thing and okay. pretending to be somebody else just to do it. It's, you know, you're not really living. Yeah, existing. And, um, yeah, you're existing exactly, and yeah. and and so as soon as I had the camera, uh, I changed. You know, I, yeah, it did. I, I had uh, I I'm basically self taught, and uh, you, you know, I feel like whenever anybody does something, and I relate a lot of it to music, is that you know there's talent and there's skill, and if you have talent for something and you don't really develop it, really you're not going to be very good. And if you you work really hard at something, but you don't have the talent, you're not going to be very good. Yeah. And so um, I think when I immediately recognized, because people would tell me, and it wasn't family and friends, it was strangers. They would say, you know, you, you could do something with this. You're, you're good at it. And I'm like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And so I started, like I told you before, I just started shooting everything, all kinds of different photography and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And, and it was, I, I finally had come to the point where I found something that w felt really authentic. And, mm -hmm. and anybody listening here, you know, I would tell them that, you know, this took a long time. I mean, I had, uh, you know, grown up, I went to college and uh, played in this band and I uh, put on concerts and I'd managed acts and we're talking a lot of years. Look, I'm old. You know? <laughs> and then all of a sudden it clicks mm. like a camera. It clicked. Ooh, um, that was, that's yeah. a good one. Good yeah, one. I didn't mean that to happen. Uh, but but that, that's what happened. So if you're, if you're like thinking to yourself, gee, I don't know, I, I, I feel lost. I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and I never really felt lost. But when I started photography, I realized I had been because I hadn't, I'd been pretending. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's just, it's been amazing. So I don't, I don't know. No, I think, I think that's so, that <laughs> I'm sticking with photography and even um, you mentioned putting captions on the yeah. magazines. And so staying on that, right? In the right. captions of your photos, you're always describing New York in different ways. And sure. yeah, and, things, and, and the one that I love the most is New York, where traveling to another part of the world is just on the next block, right? Oh yeah, now that, I don't think, I, I don't feel like I have, that's actually, not a portrait. 
I believe that that's just a um, no, I believe that's a quote a theme of I think there's a Vespa in it. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so I would call that actually like a um, a filler photo because I'm a portrait photographer. Mm -hmm. But uh, every once in a while, you know, I want to put something from a scene in there, and I I'll put uh, and and although I'm based in New York, I I, I really don't. And I talk a lot about New York, but I, I yeah, and think that so for the people that have never been to New York, like oh, that yeah. that statement where you said um, where that, traveling to another part of the world is just on the, on the next, next block. Board. Like, what does that know. mean? What, what that means them? is all right. So in New York, um, there are people from all nations coming here, and there is this. Um, dream of opportunity to come not only to the United States, but specifically to New York. In New York, for anybody listening, there's the United States, and then there's New York City. And New York City is very different from the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like the... I, I think it's important to say that I acknowledge that the romantic beginnings of the United States are anything but romantic. They are anything but about freedom. Just like a lot of other countries out in the world, the United States was formed by this ugly, ugly word called colonization and you know it, it sounds like a a really pretty word let's colonize it, it sounds like you're building something but it's like a locust and it, it many countries um you know when when you're living in the united states you're taught this uh or at least you had been things are changing but you had been taught this lie that, uh, you know, people came here for freedom and uh, they came here to rape and pillage. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it, they've done it everywhere. And uh, sadly, you know, as opposed to, uh, from what I understand in uh, Nigeria, that there's a Nigerian population. Well, here in the United States, the original inhabitants, the Native American Indians, um, there's a few of them left, but not like, I mean, uh, you look on a map, there's this big land, the United States, and you know, we, we almost annihilated our entire race of people. And so let's go back to New York, because regardless of our history, mm -hmm. New York has become something different now. And what it is, is New York is not so much a place as it is an idea. And people can be a quote unquote New Yorker wherever they live. It's just somebody that believes in the impossible that it can happen. And if you believe in it enough, sometimes it does. And it, mm. that's exciting. And so when you going back to what you're saying about it, so a, a, another uh, country is just on the next corner. Mm. So down at the end of the corner, uh, I, I might have somebody teaching me uh, Arabic. And when I go to get my hair cut, somebody's teaching me Hebrew. And a, and there's lots of people teaching me Spanish and, uh, you know, whatever culture. And, um, you know, you can meet people from all over the world. And I was so excited, you know, uh, one day I'm walking and to go back, I see Josiah. And, you know, he's um, wearing uh, traditional African prints that would be worn by... 
uh, like a woman, the, the prints themselves. It's, uh, you know, I was looking it up. I, maybe you can help me how to pronounce it when like there's a festival or there's an event like a wedding or a funeral that people wear something called, is it Ebby? Ebby. Um, there's, there's, right? there, there's different types. So that's one. There's another one called Ankaron. Um, okay. And so Ebby, and it depends on the culture as well. So some sure. people don't wear that. So frankly, I'm not even the best person to ask, but, well, um, I but um, I've heard of it. I, I the, know the, of it. Well, the point that I'm trying to make, though, is that, you know, because he's a, a, a world citizen of sorts. You of know, course, of course. He's taken the print, and I, I'm sure he, I shared this on the show, but I know he did. I was listening to it. Then he, he goes to uh, Taiwan, and uh, I believe that's where he goes. But he has a tailor make it into a suit. Mm. And so he creates his own, like, blended experiences. But he's not the only person that does this. I mean, there's people, not. Not, not that specific thing, but he's. Uh, but there's so many people in New York that come here and they share ideas. And I, I know that I'm wrong with this example, but it gets the point across. It's like um, here in the United States, uh, we have French fries. Uh, and I don't know, a lot of people uh, having been a, a previous British colony uh you might call them chips chips i don't yeah uh, do you ever hear french fries or do you just call them chips um this we call them chips now i've um at a certain point i was actually living in the states at one point oh okay I didn't yeah know. Okay. yeah and so um i call them french fries for every now and then just maybe a slip of tongue <laughs> but where, where did you live in the states a new jersey where in new jersey where was that? Uh, Denville, New Jersey, near Morristown. Morris or Morris? More. I guess it's, been, it's been a while, but <laughs> more Morristown, I think. M O R R I S. Yes, I believe. Okay, all right. So Northern Jersey. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, cool. Um, so, you, so you this word French fries. Uh, you know, in my imagination, I'm just thinking, okay, there's a guy that comes to the United States from it, uh, from Ireland, and he brings potatoes. And then there's a French guy that comes over and he says, oh, you have potatoes. Let me see what I can do with that. <laughs> and, and it's just like this exchange of ideas. And I don't know if that how it happened, but there's so many things um, that we have in the United States that are singularly American, but they only exist because people from other cultures came here and they shared ideas. And, and that's exciting to me. You know, it's like um, I, people, I, I, and I, I feel like that that's what I want to show with photography, that even if it's not in the United States, it could be, I could have a photo of somebody that is in, Paris. I, I took a photo of a, a guy in Paris and he's skateboarding. And it's like, okay, he's skateboarding and he's in Paris. And that's borrowed from the United States. The, the history of skateboarding for anybody that doesn't know is that people would surf in, in California, which, you know, there, there was a, that goes back to some island somewhere, but they, um, they couldn't surf, and so they put wheels on, on the board, and all of a sudden they're skate, skating. Wow. But here's something that goes to France: a guy skating, skateboarding, <laughs> and it only happens because he, it, it's imported, and it's shared, and you learn from each other's experiences. And we have so much as a world to learn from each other's experiences, but we'll only learn that if we are inspired and if we allow ourselves to be inspired and if we accept somebody that's different than ourselves and we appreciate them. 
mm-hmm. and and that's how we grow. And and I would uh, I want to do what I can to with photography to help that message mm-hmm. be out there. And, mm-hmm. and to show as many different types of people um, as I can to show the commonality of humanity. And then you, you do this. And, oh, you know, and I, I, and I, I got to say, I never really answered your question. The whole idea of New York is that because people have come here from all over the world, mm-hmm. um, they have brought their culture with them. And so you can have like the very, the very, very most authentic falafel that is around. You can have the most authentic uh, Ethiopian food. You can have the most authentic pizza, the most authentic German food or whatever, you know, because people come here Mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, it's their style it's their food, it's their music, their culture. Uh, there's music that's been made in the United States that never would have been made unless different cultures came together and, and uh, blended their ideas. And the blending only happens when people are accepting each other. So what, uh, they, again, going back to your question, is that you can be somewhere in New York and you can feel just for a moment because people have like set up their own culture. You can feel like, wow, um, I, I, I like this, um, these African prints that we were talking about earlier, you can be somewhere and you're on a block and um, somebody might be going to an event and you'll see like 30 people dressed that way. And, and then you go over one block and there's Greek food and there's people that are from Greece and they're speaking Greece, yeah, Greek. And uh, it just even being on a, on a subway, uh, I think I mentioned this before, you can be on a subway and you can hear 15 different languages that are from 15 different places. From what I understand in, in Nigeria, there may be as many as, uh, oh, Tons hundreds. Of like, I think it, I, I was reading, I think it said like, um, like as many as like 500 different languages. Yeah, and, but there are three main ones though. Right. Um, Yoruba, Igbo, and Aousa. Three main ones. But is but now you're speaking English. Is there because it's a former colony? Most people do speak English as well. Yeah, actually, English. I think I believe English is actually like our official official language. <laughs> like, wow. yeah. So, um, most people, like ninety five percent of people, speak English. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so you really have to like dig deep into the country to pe- for people to find for people to, um, to find people that don't speak some sort of English because some people right. m- may not be able to speak English English fluently, but they still can give you like little hints. Right. Like, you know. Right. And actually, we call that um, we have something called Pigeon English, which is basically like oh, no, broken yeah. English. Right. So yeah. people, <laughs> so people do that if they can't speak fluent English. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, and that happens here, you know, that we pick up different, um, different aspects of somebody's language and we borrow and then, and, and then we, um, you know, it it becomes something new. Mm -hmm. And I, I just find that whole blending wonderful. And in the United States, it's, it's, um, finally become more and more acceptable to have uh, multicultural marriages, uh, interracial marriages. And, um, you know, the whole idea of classism is, is, is horrible. And I know it's not limited to the United States. There's everywhere in the world, but Mm -hmm. I feel like, um, I, I feel like there's, 
a movement, a change. And, and I really feel like this, this little box here has, I, I'm, it, it has its dangers, you know, definitely it, does. But, but it also has so many possibilities in it. You know, we've seen where like, there's a lot of false information that comes across. Um, and then people claiming things are false that aren't. You know, it's just like, um, you know, it's, but, but when there's a one-on-one -on -one contact and you're talking to somebody, you know, just like you and I are now, it, it's like, wow, you know. Uh, um, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. It really is. It, yeah. it's, it's just something that says, you know, we're all human. And uh, I, I don't care about some sort of like oil thing, <laughs> you know, and it's like, let's fight over oil. Let's fight over this. And, you know, the fact is, is that, you know, if we would all just communicate more and, uh, there would be a, a much better chance. I, I don't, I don't want to be unrealistic and feel like, uh, you know, we could all live in some sort of utopia, but we can certainly be more decent to each other. Mm -hmm. and, and a thing that like shows my age, but it's kind of universal. It's still current is there was a, um, a musician that was in the Beatles, John Lennon. And I don't know if, uh, you even know the song or anybody watching this does you, have you ever heard of the song imagine imagine ah yeah can you sing it can um, you hum it um it, it's just i know john lennon you know, okay <laughs> hold on just a second here we're gonna, sure. we're gonna just, no problem I, I think it's more important to um than me remember i can't sing we um, can try. Don't worry. I won't judge you. No, no. We don't want that. We don't want that on record forever. No, no. Uh, here, we're going to put on. See, we got to do this here. Um, imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. And it, it goes on. But it's just that whole idea that... Uh, that we can have a lot better chance of harmony if, if we don't get hung up on stuff that doesn't really matter. I mean, why should we be hung up on whether or not somebody is male or female or whether or not, like I understand in Nigeria, there's uh, two of the major religions are Muslim and Christianity. And it's like, what does it matter? You know, it, uh, why would you fight over something like that? It, it, Million it dollar question. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. You know, it, it's like, uh, you know, both. I mean, everybody, when you ask them, well, what is what is that all about? You know, well, it's about love, loving each other. Really? Then why are you fighting? So <laughs> It doesn't, it's being hung up on things that really aren't important. And if we would just be um, appreciating each other's differences as an opportunity to learn rather than, um, you know, this whole isolationism. So many governments right now are about isolating themselves and cutting themselves off from the rest of the world. And uh, that's not going to happen. They can try. It's not, I mean, we've, we've been trying to do it here in the United States and um, it, it's simply not going to happen because, because the internet is like, it's a box that you can't close. And now that it's open, people yes. know the truth. Definitely. They know, they know that, um, you know, the governments tell you, oh, like in, here in the United States, they tell you, oh, Russians, are, you watch out for them. You can't trust them. They're evil. They're this. And now has the Russian government, 
actually done some bad things. All governments seem to do bad things. But I'll talk to somebody in Russia and, you know, they, um, they want to have fun. They yeah, want, they, they want, uh, they just want to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. And they're, uh, I was in, where was, I was in Mumbai and, uh, I was along the river near the gateway. There's uh, I don't know if you know, there's a gateway to India in Mumbai yeah. and, um, along the way there was a, uh, this was last year. There was a man that was sitting down and he, uh, he had a camera. So it's kind of like this camera community. You can, you can <laughs> talk to anybody. He barely spoke English, but he spoke some. And I told him I was from the United States. I try not to tell people I'm from the United States. I tell them I'm from New York because that way they, they're like, Oh, New York. It's a, Hey, kind of thing. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we just, he was immediately kind of defensive that, you know, maybe I would hold it against him that he was from Russia. And we had a wonderful conversation and I will probably never see each other again, but, uh, you know, we, we had the commonality camera and, and we were both visiting and in, and we were both in a, a, a place that we weren't familiar with. And that can happen on the internet. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, you just learn that people, people are really all the same. And actually about that story, because I, I was actually going to ask you a question about that particular story, actually, because um, um, on your Instagram, under the caption of, of that man in particular, you said, um, I love that if we try, we can all share the language of humanity. Right. And so I just I wanted to know like what you meant by that. I don't know which picture I, uh, what specific photo I had that under. That um, was um, the guy Mumbai, the guy that, um, I guess he could have oh, understand that English. Been, that, was, that might have been Suresh, uh, who is from India. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, Suresh, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. It was I don't know under his caption or not, but Suresh is a um, big uh, news personality, and I photographed him when I was in Mumbai. Um, the person, the the um, the photo was the guy. He was he had like um, a singlet or like a, a white beater. He was, and it's it's one of your more recent photos. One of my more recent ones. Well, let me see. Um, when you went to Mumbai, India. Uh, let me try. It was in Mumbai. Huh? You know. And you were able to communicate and like pose him and take a photo of him. Oh, oh yes. No, no, that he from Mumbai too. I remember that one. Um, yeah, I don't have to look it up right now, but yeah, I do remember the one you were talking about. So yeah, th this man, I was, um, it, it wasn't the Russian. This was uh, somebody that was from Mumbai and Mumbai yeah. has a number of different languages mm -hmm. and, uh, I had kind of come to a determination which language he was speaking because like in Nigeria, they have many languages in India. And um, I, I saw him and, you know, we just, uh, I, I don't know how to explain it, but, you know, humans are curious about, I, I, I think in general, we as humans, when we, see anything, not just another human, but a situation or anything, we either look at it suspiciously or with curiosity. And the suspiciousness does keep us alive sometimes, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's like, oh, it's an alligator. Oh, maybe I, I'm curious. Let me pet the alligator. No, maybe you don't want to see that. Uh, so it is there for us to protect us, but it's also there for us to govern when we should be suspicious and when we should be curious. And 
and um, the encounter with this one individual, we looked at each other and we were we were curious. And uh, there's a um, uh, a communication. That there's a lot of nonverbal communications that people have throughout the world. And if I, I kind of gestured holding up my camera to ask permission whether or not. I could take a photo of him. And um, in India, if somebody is agreeable, they kind of shake their head like this a little bit. And and he was up for it. But, um, you know, there's we had we went through a series of nonverbal communications. But when we looked at each other in the eye, you know, we could we could see that we were welcoming each other and that we were curious it was okay we didn't have to be suspicious and and i think that when we enter the world with openness that um that we give ourselves these opportunities to learn so much and to expand our own world view and um it, it's exciting so yeah, i i had motioned to him to uh, have him sit up on a cart and um, and he did so and uh, you know I would I just use my hands to kind of motion him how to pose a little bit and uh, it was a wonderful time you know mm. we, we were both kind of uh, laughing and exchanging something without ever speaking the same language and um, so although we were motioning and there is just this like shared human experience. So I think that that's what I mean about we're speaking the language of humanity. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I feel like that, um, I, I think that there's so much that we can communicate non-verbally. Uh, I've heard statistics where people say that as much as 90% of how we talk to each other is, is not so much the words. It's you know, are you seeing somebody that is friend or foe? Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like, you know, just be a friend. <laughs> Definitely should. And one way, I'm um, talking about communication, obviously, fashion, as you know, fashion, style is a way of communication, as you kind of said before. And so I just wanted to know, like, what exactly is a street unicorn um uh, yeah so so uh as i mentioned i've taken a lot of uh, you know done a lot of different types of photography and you know i i feel like somewhere along the way that i started to see people that were taking risks now, you mentioned, you know, I'd been in the band. And, you know, when we were in the band many, many years ago, you know, you had a look. And I had really long hair and wearing earrings and, you know, just had all kinds of different clothes. And it wasn't something that I just wore on stage. This was who I was. So I would go to weddings. I would go to funerals. This was me. You know, I'm not going to pretend to be something different. And because of that, I would get uh, ridiculed. My, uh, my parents didn't approve. And, um, you know, it was just, but I wanted to be me. <clears throat> I felt like I was expressing who I was. And, and so there, I always had a certain amount of empathy for people that put it on the line, that risked that were risking criticism versus being authentic. And um, as I was traveling, but specifically, I guess it started here in New York because New York is a place where you can be whoever you want to be and nobody really cares. Literally, you can walk around dressed like a chicken and nobody cares 
There's, there's just too many people here going about their own lives. If you want to uh, dress dress up like a flamingo, uh, nobody. You have wow. to do a lot in New York to be noticed, and and it's easy to blend in. Most people here in New York, for whatever reason, they wear black, like all black, and they just kind of like seamlessly blend in, but. There's many people that that will go Stand to great like, right to to be like peacock. So I started seeing people that um, you know were were as far as I call them street unicorns, and I haven't heard the term. I've heard unicorns, street style, and everything like that, uh, but people that really stood out, people that I knew were taking risks that were maybe, maybe they don't care if they're seen, but they are. And, uh, you know, I, I just really appreciate them. And I was curious, going back to this whole thing about being suspicious or curious, I was curious. I would, I would go up to somebody and talk to them and be like, you know, Tell me about, you know, your outfit. What does it mean to you? You know, what are you trying to say with it? How does it make you feel? And why are you doing it? And I learned all kinds of great, great insight to humanity. And, you know, people were, uh, you know, for some people, it was the way they would, be happy. You know, they were maybe fighting depression. Uh, other people, it was about their sexuality. Other people, uh, recently I would taken photos of a woman um, that uh, is Muslim and she was wearing um, her head wrap. Uh, I never know how to say it. Hadith. Hijab. Or... Yeah, and but she was doing it in a stylish way. And she was really making a concerted effort to be um, very stylish. <clears throat> and because she and she did so because she was making a statement that she could still be a strong, independent woman and appreciate her faith. And she didn't have to be, um, you know, just a possession of her man. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, it goes back to the women's rights and, and that women are humans and not things. And so, you know, there's all kinds, I would learn all of these different stories about what people were looking to express. And, at some point, I wanted to photograph them and, and put the stories with the photos and, and help inspire other people uh, to take risks in how they present themselves. And because a lot of people, they have this inside them. They want to say something, but they're, they're scared. They're scared of criticism. In some instances, instances in some countries, they're, they could be afraid of being arrested and prosecuted or killed and um you know we're fortunately there is this aspect of the united states that you can you know uh be a little non-conventional mm -hmm. and uh, and i think cities in general not just in the united states but cities in general allow this like i don't know i want to ask you and uh, how do you say it? Uh, Lagos? Lagos. Lag Lagos. 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 <laughs> I'm sure that there's a lot more, e even amongst everything that's happening right now there, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot more liberal, <clears throat> liberal behavior accepted there mm -hmm. than other places. In, the, in other places. In the, in the yeah, because... I guess Lagos here is our international hub. So you, we have a lot of cultures 
uh, in Lagos. Right. And people flying in every single day. So they're, and then, um, so there are a lot more maybe lax. I mean, we, we still have, I mean, the average Nigerian, if they see something that doesn't conform, they're like, they'll like it, like they'll they'll let you know <laughs> that like okay it's interesting but in lagos it's more okay oh okay you're you're not from here now if you're not in like in the major cities it's like whoa what is this so yes so it, here in abuja right. and lagos it's, it's right so i find this everywhere like if yeah. you go if you're in london there's certain parts of london that are a lot more um accepting and liberal mm -hmm. whereas if you go out into uh, the rural countryside, and that can be the same thing in Paris, or uh, if you're in Sydney and Australia, if you go out into the um, out into the country land or anywhere, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's cities in general, like uh, are they tend to be a place where there's mixing and a mixing of ideas and. New York just happens to be kind of the, in the modern world, as maybe Rome was at one time or something, but in the modern world, New York is the place where the world comes together. Mm -hmm. And, um, but this does happen in other countries, in Tokyo, Hong Kong, um, you know, there's, um, all over the world, wherever you find a city, people are like, have to accept that they're not going to find everybody from their hometown there. And mm -hmm. of course, um, and you're going to, and I kind of tend to feel that people that come to cities have a more curious nature than people that stay in the countryside in the rural area because they i i'll talk to people that have like and just imagine in a, a small little area of nigeria where people have never left they've never gone I, i'm going to try to say it again lagos close enough lagos, it, uh, um, lagos? There you go. There you go. There, there you go. go. Yeah. There They've go. never gone to live and they're in a small little area. They might even be afraid to go to Lego. Oh no, that's where bad things happen. Or that's where, you know, I don't know. I'm going to stay here mm -hmm. and, and they could live their whole lives. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just want more. <laughs> I want to learn I understand. more. <laughs> and, and and I feel like the more you learn, the more open you can be, the more you can appreciate humanity. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and and so it's the same way in the United States. There's, uh, I'll call it Kansas, you know, there's this area, there's a whole state. And it's like, oh, we're never going to New York. Crazy people live in New York, you know, they... We don't know what they do in the streets there, you know. I mean, it's almost like it has its own stigma or uh, like, when you went to New York, it's like, what? So it depend, right. depend, depending on how maybe New York was introduced to you. Because some, some people may say like, New York, New York is great. So I'm like, okay, New York must be great. Then other people might be like, New York is horrible. Like, okay, I guess, I guess it's bad. Well, I, I was born here. Yeah. And then when I was young, we moved away. Also in New Jersey, we were outside of the Philadelphia area when oh, I was wow. growing up. But all my relatives were living in New York, mm -hmm. and I would come to visit. And um, no, I always, uh, I've always looked at New York like uh, just the most exciting place around. And uh -huh. you know, and, and it is the people. It is the. It's not the place. It's the idea. Mm, like New that. York, and yeah. and I think like when I would, I'd interview a lot of people when I was in Mumbai, and the idea of a city, forget New York, the idea of a city that it that that there's unknown, that there's um, 
that there's opportunity, that there's curiosity to experience something different. People that want to experience something different are, uh, they're dreamers. And, and uh, so when people come to a city, they expect something different to happen. They expect something different to happen to them. And that that they will be able to do something that they've never done before. And for some people, that Perhaps. means going back to the style, that means the liberation to be able to be who they are. And this might be something really, really minor for somebody that lived in a small little town and just wore let's say a suit, they come to the city and they put like a little colorful pocket square in and they're like, wow, I feel different, you know, and, and it, it's just something that releases them. Mm -hmm. And it could be really like, you could just wear a shirt. I'm wearing something very neutral for what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Like maybe I'll wear a red shirt, you know, Maybe I'll put on, a, maybe I'll borrow a shirt from Josiah. <laughs> and, and it's like, wow, you know, here we go. Where, where are we at here? Let me, let me just put this on here. Um, where are we? Here we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Paul, you look at the world differently now, you know, it's in 3D. Yeah. So, wow. so it's, um, you know, it is. It's the ability to see the world differently, and <laughs> it, and uh, not and to be able to see the world from somebody else's eyes, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and and that's uh, and and style can play a big part of that. You you'll look at just like just like ideas for food can blend, like the French fries. You know, you can see somebody's style and maybe I want to wear something. Maybe, maybe if Josiah and I ever go to Taiwan, I'll get a suit made and I'll wear, you, know, you know, something wild, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and there is, um, as, as, uh, a descendant. Now, I don't think I am directly, but you know, my culture as a descendant of somebody that uh, comes from some country centuries ago that was part of colonization. I'm, I'm very sensitive to not appropriate something that really doesn't belong to me, and, and then that's because it's dishonorable. You know, but but there is. Uh, I think that there is a uh, a flattering way to uh, to elevate somebody else's message, and uh, you know, it, 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 I think it's all to do with intentionality. And if you have a good heart and you really uh, really want to help elevate somebody else's message. That's great, but, um, uh, but yeah, style and uh, it, people borrow from it all over in New York uh, in a very flattering way, uh, just one on one, and and it's it's really it's really amazing, and your photos really help, I guess, them like show that. Um, there's even one, there's one in particular that. I think there was a particular guy, he, he had a stutter or something, but his fashion helped him communicate. Oh, that was, who was that? I remember that story. Yeah, and when I saw that, that really stood out to me. And I was like, wow, this is really yeah, <laughs> amazing. I'm trying to remember that. That's, that's a wonderful story. Who? 
I believe he like I can't remember, can't remember his name, but it was something about seventies. Like the, his clothes. Oh yes, yes, right, right. Okay, now now I got it. Yeah, yeah, that's um, Ryan mm-hmm. Ryan McDevitt. His his Instagram handle is Wrangler shit, mm-hmm. and um, I don't know where he's originally from, but um, yeah, Ryan. Um, He's actually uh, a working model. He's tall and you know, and got uh, a unique look, which in fashion or style, you know, you want to have something where people are flipping pages or scrolling, mm-hmm. and and they go, oh, that's different, you know. So you you look different. Mm-hmm. But he initially, I think that uh, you know that there's different struggles that each of us have and that fashion or style, more importantly style, can can help us fill in the gap of sorts. Uh, there's another similar story where um, a, a an individual that I took a photo of, uh, he's a uh, uh, heterosexual male, but as he was growing up, he was, um, he was, a bit effeminate and he was ridiculed by his father a lot. Mm. And so subsequently he ended up getting a lot of tattoos to like overcompensate for that. And it, it just, it helped him through the stress of growing up. And, uh, you know, so like Ryan stuttering, it, um, it's just kind of filling in the gaps. Mm. And so there's, I would have never expected to learn that if I wasn't a little curious and and saw somebody that was putting themselves out there. And a, a lot of times, you know, if you look really different, you're not going to be accepted by the masses. But, you know, being a little different, it, it kind of says, hey, I matter. I, I'm, I'm somebody. So that's, uh, yeah, I was... I, I love learning uh, and about people that way. And, uh, yeah. And so, and so, staying on New York itself, New York. If, mm-hmm. if, um, in your opinion, what's the one must visit location when you come to New York City, apart from just the Statue of Liberty? Sure. <laughs> of course. Um, I. You know, a lot of people would, um, a lot of people would say, "Oh, you got to go to Times Square because everybody's heard of Times Square." Uh, no, that's the last place you'd want to go. And I, and I think there's a commonality in this with all cities, in every city, and now Europe and the capital. But I'm assuming you have made a trip to Lagos, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. when you're in a big city there's going to be tourists that come there like you said mm-hmm. and merchants have set up an area that caters to tourists in every city I've been to and this is like the most inauthentic area of every city you if you go, you know, let's say that you're in Paris and you go to the Eiffel Tower, you're not really going to see any Parisians there. You're going to see other people from around the world, which is nice. But, you know, it, as far as a must-do place to go visit, when I want to go to any city and get a feel for what is happening, um, it's... I try to go a little out of the city. Not, I, I'm in the city, but I, <laughs> I like if, if there's a, like a center area that is Times Square or the Eiffel Tower or Big Ben in London or something like that. I just try to go a little further from that area and 
I don't know, you should kind of get a sense for a little restaurant that might be where only the locals would go. And, um, and then I'll usually tell somebody, I'll apologize and say, you know, if it's in a language that I don't know, I'll, uh, another great thing about the internet, there's like this language translator, um, like, uh, I don't know, let me, I'm going to do a little test here, if you bear with me. Um, tell me one of the major languages in Nigeria that you mentioned. There's one that begins with an I. Um, there's one Yoruba, Yoruba. Do you know, is it there? Y, y O R U B A. Y, uh huh. Okay. All right. So then I would say, um, uh, what's my name? All right. My, my name is. No, I got something more, much more important that you'd want to tell somebody. Uh, um, you'd want to know. Let's see. So you're somewhere and, and you know, you're wandering around and you're in a place you don't understand. And, and at some point you're going to want to know. Yeah, it's 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 not it's not it's not in focus. It's not in focus. Oh, here we go. Nibu nibu Basically, you you nibu nibu Like, I think it's asking like where where I am. Basically, is that no? no uh, oh, I thought you might know the language. No, 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 no the things that if if um I can't really read it, but if if it says it out loud, I is there a way? Nibu 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 Wow. No, no, I mean, uh, is there like, um, oh, here, here, yeah, yeah, you can do this too. This, this, this is the other thing you can do here. Let, let's see. Um, how do you do this? Oh, I think it'll, no, somehow you can get it to say it. I think that, and, and so with, like, for example, um, Yoruba, Yoruba is actually the language that <laughs> my, family speaks and so i understand it to like a certain extent and okay. so well, this, and, this, and so and so for example if it says like the most basic things like where 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 am i at my name is ravi right. <laughs> or like um where's the food this no. was, this was this was asking where where is the bathroom okay, yeah I, I knew it was where there was a word that says where in there all right. So, well, you know, I was in uh, I was in Lisbon last year, mm -hmm. and there was a woman. I had an entire conversation with her on Google Translate, and she had uh, I had found a place in Lisbon that was further off the track, and she didn't speak any English. Most places in in a city, you know, people you'll find somebody that speaks English somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but she didn't. And she was just in a little doorway. And I don't know if I can find, well, it's not important. Um, but she was in a little doorway and she'd been looking out this doorway at the world her whole life. And, um, but um, I'd asked her a bunch of questions. It's not important right now, but, but the Google Translate, uh, it is is really good, but going back to where in New York do you go? Um, I feel like one thing I think is important. Now, it, 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 it's a difficult question because there's so many singular areas of New York that help mm. define it, mm -hmm. but. Um, Mm. There's, there's actually, I, I, I just feel like if you can find uh, a small restaurant mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. that's a little further out. Mm -hmm. um, what about? I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna name one place. It is touristy, mm -hmm. but but it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. It's not you know a lot of people go to a place called Cats K A T Z. It's mm -hmm. a, uh, a Jewish deli, but I'd rather go to a place called Russ and, uh, Russ and Daughters. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, it, it, 
bagels are really big mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. and uh, I'm sure you know that from living in the mm-hmm. area mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's really just um, just go somewhere where you can find somebody that's lived here their whole life and talk to them mm-hmm. so it's like it's not so much a where in New York you need to go it's more of a who do you need to meet in mm-hmm. New York mm-hmm. And you're not going to meet too many lifelong New Yorkers in Times Square. There are some, but, you know, it's mainly filled with tourists. But if you mm-hmm. can go um, or, or find somebody that, has, um, that is living here, like mm-hmm. um, it, it's that story of coming here. It's it, whether you're talking to somebody like myself or mm-hmm. like Jaya, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's... Um, There, there are people that are just on the street that you can just meet. There's a whole community. Anybody out there that's listening to this because they're a photographer. If you come to New York, there's a whole photography community. Now, when uh, it, they, they just, they're in an area called Soho. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they're taking a lot of photos of fashion models and that are just walking on the streets and such. But, you know, there's there's a whole community of people to, to talk to and learn why they're there. Why did you come to New York? And um, so mm. I don't think there's a particular place. I think you can go almost anywhere in New York, but I, I would say just stay away from the typical tourist places, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. not only in New York, but wherever you go. Definitely. All you're going to find is, uh, you know, uh, in Lagos, I'm sure there's a McDonald's. I'm sure there's, uh, there's, there's no McDonald's, but we have a KFC here. We have, we, we have like a shop, right? We, I mean, the thing is that, so there are tourist locations when you come here. And of are course, there, is, there, is there a Starbucks? Starbucks, no, the, the only Starbucks I think in Africa is in South Africa. There's no Starbucks here in Nigeria. Oh, okay. Right, right, right. Okay. But um, we definitely have tourist locations like everywhere else, and which is not the real Nigeria. You have to go <laughs> down, then you start seeing like the actual <laughs> Nigerians. Because of course, like every country has their tourism places. Right. You know, I, I, I just think that it's so important to when you go somewhere um, is to get out of the main city area mm-hmm. a bit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, um, you know, and if you have an opportunity, just like I was less, when I was, excuse me, when I was talking to Josiah, I was less excited about maybe going to Lagos and more excited about going to Jaw. I'd gone on Google Maps and looked all around and, mm-hmm. and you know, this is a, a, a smaller area, mm-hmm. but, but, you know, it would probably give me um, a, a better, better understanding, world, a better understanding. Right. Yeah. Of the Nigerian uh, people. It definitely would. Right. Because a lot of times, also in Lagos, we have lots of, even though Nigeria has its fair share of its poverty as well, in Lagos, there are a lot of very rich people. And so, right. <laughs> and, sure. and so depending on who you hang out with over there, you can have like the best time of your entire life in Lagos. Sure. So, I mean... So I, I, I think that if, if you're a traveler, yeah. and you're going somewhere... Yes, you want to experience some of the city, uh, like in New York. Uh, there is Manhattan, but there's also other other areas like uh, the Bronx mm-hmm. and Queens and Brooklyn, mm-hmm. um, and that where you're going to meet people that are more um, more authentically New Yorkers. Uh, mm-hmm. then you know there's a, a a lot of people that well you were like in living in new jersey a lot of people that work in new york are Definitely. from morristown new jersey mm-hmm. yeah. and they 
train in and they leave. And where do they go? They they come into New York and maybe they work in Times Square or they work in Wall Street, but they're not New Yorkers. And so I would imagine that if you go to Lagos or if you go to Paris or when you go to London or when you go to Sydney or Barcelona or uh, other major cities, Berlin, that that the people that are in the heart of the city are not the real citizens. And yeah. so whenever you go anywhere like New York, you just go a little further out and you'll you find a, the a, real New Yorkers. The real New Yorkers. And, and so and, mm-hmm. go ahead. No, no, it's fine. You got it. It's, you got it. I was just going to say, is it important when you go to a city to see uh, the Brooklyn Bridge or Central Park or the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty or, or the Flatiron Building or all the other landmarks? Just like if you're in Paris, is it important to see the Arch de Triomphe and, or the Eiffel Tower and uh, Luxembourg Gardens and all the other uh places to see sure but but go i encourage people to meet the people and to that's how you're not going to expand your world view talking to uh you know somebody else like if, if there's a really good chance that if you're a New Yorker and you go to Paris and you go to the touristy area, you could have lunch with another New Yorker. <laughs> Why? Why would you do that? Because yeah. you're comfortable? Why did you leave New York? Yeah, but, if, but, if you, but if you can go a little further out and meet somebody that maybe doesn't even speak, like if you're in Paris, if you go a little further out and you can find somebody that might not even speak English, only French, and you can do your best to communicate mm-hmm. uh, that way. Like when I went to Mumbai and you were like talking about the, the gentleman that, you know, we spoke humanity. I could have gone to places in Mumbai. They, they had them all mapped out. Where's all the tourist places? And, you know, why? Yeah. And so I'd come, back, I'd come back and people would be like, you mean you went to Mumbai and you didn't see this? Like, no, no. I didn't. I yeah. wanted to meet people. And so that's that's what I like to do. And that's, and that's really amazing. And the thing is that, so there's actually one place in particular that I, I guess I found from you. Would you recommend people to, would you recommend that people check out McSorley's Old Ale House <laughs> um, <laughs> on 7th Street? So, right, so I, I have... I have an affinity to McSorley's old ale house. I, 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 it's ama- amazing that you bring that up. Uh, I do have a photo of it somewhere on my Instagram. Mm-hmm. I think I took it with a cell phone. Yeah. But, and I, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but um, so I was, uh, I was 17 or 18 years old and I was in college. And the first time I went to McSorley's, it's a, for anybody listening, McSorley's is a very, very old uh, bar uh, in New York, one of the oldest bars. Has a nice story behind it. But uh, I went there for the first time in the trunk of a car. And, oh, you must know this. This is why you brought it up. But you did a little bit. You're, you're a good researcher. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, McSorley's is kind of a touristy place for locals. I mean, there are tourists go there, but also people from the outer boroughs from New Jersey. And it, it's uh, there are some locals that go there, too. It's a good mix. And they have mm-hmm. sawdust on the floor and the bartenders come in and they carry um, 12 beers at one time. They have like a beer on each finger and then two in the middle. They slam them down. The suds go on the floor. They hit the step sawdust. Uh, but wow. I was um, I was uh, wanting to be a member of a club in, at my college, pledging a fraternity. And um, 
part of the initiation was a trip to New York. And because the, the college I was going to uh, was in New Jersey. Uh, if you're familiar with Rutgers, I don't know. Yes, uh, my sister actually went there. Oh, well, okay. After right. graduated so, from there. So uh, I was wanting to be a part of this group and the, the initiation was to go to New York. We went on a scavenger hunt, ended up at McStorley's. And uh, ever since then, I've had uh, an affinity for it. And it's, it, yeah, I, I think if somebody's into going to a bar uh, when they're somewhere, you know, some people drink, some people don't, but if you want to mm -hmm. have uh, a beer, McSorley's is a, a great place to go. Uh, it is a New York kind of institution. <laughs> and um, I, I, yeah. yeah so so how did, ex how exactly did you end up in the trunk of a car <laughs> well all right so so if so you're going through this uh big initiation and uh it was it was called hell week and uh you know they they put you through a lot of tests to see if they feel you're worthy of being in their club in their fraternity and uh so it was a big scavenger hunt in in new york and so you're in new jersey and they're like okay Here's part of your test. And they put you in the trunk with other initiates. And they and we didn't know where we were going. We were blindfolded and put into a trunk like we're being uh, kidnapped. And then they, they gave us a list of things that we needed to do, it was a, like a map. And the first thing that they wanted us to do, they dropped us off uh, initially in Central Park. And, we, and they gave us the list. And the list, uh, first thing on the list was go to a certain place and buy some marijuana from a, uh, a guy that they knew was going to be there waiting. <laughs> we all had to buy a joint, a cigarette. And we'll go back to this here. <laughs> yeah. And we all had to do that. And if you followed the directions on the scavenger hunt, on the mm -hmm. list. If you did that successfully, and there were like about 12, 10 or 12 things that you had to do, if you did that, you would end up at McSorley's and your reward was to drink and have a beer. And we did, it was great. And uh, so I was successful and I got into the club. A couple people didn't, but you know, uh, yeah. So, so it was almost yeah. part of like, I guess your hazing process in a way. Oh, <laughs> definitely hate it. I didn't want to use that word. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, I was part. Uh, so now, fast forward, there's all of the, uh, there some people that have gone through hazing, people have died. Um, you know, not intentionally. It's just like things went too far, got yeah. out of hand. Went south. But from what I understand, after I had gone through it a couple of years later, our particular fraternity was um, in large part responsible for a lot of new rules uh, because, yeah, things, things like that happened. <laughs> I guess that's this part of the, I guess, college, yeah, college experience, I guess, depending on, depending on which frat. The college experience. Yeah. yeah. I actually went to, um, do you know George Mason University? It's like... What, what, what's the name of the university? George Mason University. Near like, D, like near, near DC, oh, Virginia. Okay. That's actually where um, I went to school at. All right. And so uh, I know about, I, and so I wasn't part of fret, but I know I have very close friends that <laughs> they definitely went through their own hell week. <laughs> and so sure. when they came back, they were, <laughs> they were, uh, <laughs> I guess, tired because they, oh, yeah. them, they put them through a lot. Oh yeah. You didn't, uh, we didn't sleep. Uh, we were allowed, uh, so it was for a whole week and we were allowed one to two hours a night to sleep. And um, they gave us um, lots of drugs to be able to stay awake that whole week. And then I, after that week was over and I uh, successfully got in, I was in bed for like two weeks. 
I, I like, yeah. It, mm. uh, and I think, yeah. mm -hmm. and the thing about never, rats. In, in, in retrospect, it was a stupid thing to do it. I would hey. never do it again. <laughs> Anybody out there, don't join a fraternity. There's other ways to meet friends. Mm -hmm. Now, now some fraternities are lifelong. Is your own lifelong? Yeah, I'm lifelong. Yeah. Okay. In fact, when I moved to New York, um, I saw a guy, you know, a fraternity for anybody that doesn't know, they have Greek letters, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, different uh, symbols to say, I'm in this fraternity. And a guy was wearing a shirt that was from my fraternity. And they're national. So there's different chapters all around the country. Anybody, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm expecting that I'm talking to a world market. So you are. anybody that doesn't know, it's a club mm -hmm. and there's different groups all, all around that mm -hmm. have, are in the same club. And I saw the guy that had the sign that says he was in this fraternity on his shirt. And mine was called Delta Sigma Phi. And uh, I saw him and I said, oh, you're Delta Sigma Phi. He goes, yeah. And initially, uh, right away, I said, all right, give me the secret handshake. And, and so he knew the secret handshake. So uh, that automatically made us like, okay, I know you. And, and I ended up, um, ended up doing photography for his engagement photos. And that wow. this was up here uh, in the uh, northern part of New York. When I first moved here, I moved to an area called Washington Heights. Mm -hmm. And that's where, that's where I met him. And um, yeah, I mean, it's nice, but you know. Um, but it, it has its benefits. It definitely has its benefits. Yeah, I guess. I mean, a lot of people are in fraternities that are very professional, lifelong. And because you're in this fraternity, you, you get jobs, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you have, it's a good networking. Mm -hmm. But I never utilized it so much. I mean, for me, it really was about rebelliousness and, you know. But I guess, like I said, it's all part of the college experience. It's definitely a part of the college experience. Uh, it's definitely part of growing and learning. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And so talking about experiences, we have come to the end of this experience. So Ravi. I want to say a very big thank you for coming on. We really, really appreciate you. It's been a pleasure. You know, it, it's just exciting to me with, um, you know, as much as like style connects us, it's just, I'm just blown away that two people that really don't know each other and can connect and, uh, that I know that you, I mean, you share that you live here, mm -hmm. but even if you hadn't, you know, that there's people that I talk to that are in like Turkey and Russia and all over the world that uh, it, it's just exciting. And I, I just, um, anybody that's listening, I just uh, beyond, I mean, style is just another way that we can talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just encourage people, just keep talking to people that are outside of your comfort zone because, uh, you know, you, it's just so exciting. And, and it's really living. Mm -hmm. and, and so this, this, what we've done here, this has... Uh, it, this has been so enjoyable for me. I mean, we, uh, now that we have talked, I'm like, oh, you know, you might, you might visit. So this has happened to me mm -hmm. many times. You may come to New York. When you come to New York, we're going to go to McStory. That'd and, be great. And, and you know, um, and if I go, if, if I end up going to Joss, with Josiah, you know, we're going to probably fly into the capital. You have, right? Is, yep. That would be, that would be the place that we would fly into, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. If you're going to Joss. And so obviously there I am. 
<laughs> we're probably going to see you. <laughs> yes. you know? and, and this happened. And so, yeah, yeah, just. Uh, it's, re- it's really amazing. I, I would love to. I would love to come there, take your photo, post it, and then have this story to tell. Yeah. I mean, fantastic. things that, um, it's definitely something that we we should make happen at some point. Sure. Like either next year, or some sometime, should definitely come to Nigeria. Hopefully mm. when the pandemic's not happening, when there yeah. isn't. Um, definitely. Ice and violence. <laughs> yeah. and, and even more, with, yeah. even the pandemic, who knows when that's ending? Really, but uh, <laughs> hopefully, soon. hopefully, very, hopefully, very soon. Oh wait, you know the important thing is. I think I know. Baby, wearing masks. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if yeah. it does your mask, mm-hmm. it'll go away soon. Mm-hmm. But you know, taking off the mask when you know it, here. Don't take the mask off. <laughs> it's funny. I knew you're about to put the mask on. <laughs> what makes sense? I, makes sense. You know, I don't do I don't do Zoom much. Okay. Uh, and and um, you know, earlier you you saw my wife. She was uh, helping me with the technology. She's mm-hmm. on like three or four times a week at least. Wow! 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 Uh, so she was walking me through and she showed me all these toys and I'm like, oh, I'm playing with these toys. <laughs> totally, you know, I don't know. Whoa. <laughs> Your skin. You know, it's like, yeah, how can you not have a, a, a little fun? Yeah, like a little kid. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Because hold, hold on to that inner child. Definitely. And that's something that I wish more people did. Because like you said, some people, like in New York, only the only wear black and there's, and there's, and there's I, yeah, so not me. I, I, I can't, I can't relate to that. And I, and I know you can't either. And so, Robbie, and so guys, Robbie is actually releasing a book titled. Oh, yeah. yeah we want to plug that. Unicorns where he shares the images and viewpoints of some of the amazing people he meets or he, he or he has met while photographing in New York City. And I believe you can find more information about the book at www.streetunicorn.com. You right? can. You yes. can there. You can find me at Robbie and it's R O B D I E, mm-hmm. Robbie Quinn N Y C. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then the uh, the book is Street Unicorn's book. And it's uh, currently being uh, presented to different publishers. I'm hoping that it's not just like the small book that I'm going to present. I'm hoping that a big publisher likes it and that it'll uh, it'll go out to the world. And that would be that'd be wonderful. Great, great. And of course, for more everyday stories and amazing guests like Ravi, <laughs> please be sure to like, subscribe, and follow wherever or whenever you're listening or watching this particular episode. So yeah. my name thank is Tunde. Robbie, yeah, you're you great. So <laughs> I think what you're doing is a wonderful thing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I've met, so, I've met really amazing people. Just like I'm speaking to you now. Normally, how would I have met Josiah? Like without Instagram. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know. I didn't know how you met him. So you found that you through Um. Brand? So yeah, and things that so. Um. Here in Nigeria, I actually, I actually run something called the Nigerian Photographers Hub. Oh, so okay. it's um it's a community. It's like a so it's a community based platform that inspires, educates, and connects Nigerian professional photographers. Oh, and we wow. ha- and we have this hashtag hashtag Nigerian Photographers Hub. So at some point, um, Josiah had to use the hashtag. And so on my Instagram, I follow our hashtag. And so I guess I liked a couple of pictures and I followed him at some point. And I've been following him for maybe a little while, like a year or so. And then eventually, I believe he started noticing that I was liking his things. Then he followed me back. Right. And then that, um, but when he followed me back, I was doing this project. Then he left a comment under one of my posts. And I was like, 
and I was like, wow, okay, do you, <laughs> I, actually, he was like, actually, he wanted to be part of the project. And I was like, sure. Then yeah. I was like, um, episode 19, you're actually episode 20. And so, <laughs> and so um, yeah, we made it happen. We did the Instagram live, we spoke, it was great. And the one thing I really enjoy about this is, as you can tell, the research process. Yeah, you, you do your homework. I, I know that you surprised him with a bunch of stuff. So you did. You, you found some, and it's like you found stuff that you wouldn't think you'd find. Definitely, yeah. Because yeah. even for this interview, um, I, I really go, I really do my due dil- my due um, diligence. diligence. Like, yeah. like for example, you did like two other podcasts before. I did, and which yeah. I listen, which I listened to in the entirety <laughs> within the. This is the whole thing. And of course, like your Instagram, like when I go through, like, for example, when I talk to people, like if you have 2000 posts, I literally go through your two, every single one of them. And so that's wow. how I'm able to know the mom by story, the quotes, McSorley's. And so yeah. um, it's, that's really, it's really interesting finding these things about amazing people like, like yourself. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, and so, um, yeah, so thank you again. I really appreciate you. Um, now that I've spoken, I mean, I guess, well, just message me anytime. Um, any, if you need anything here in Nigeria or any questions, uh, let me know. Same time, I'll message you if anything comes up. But yeah, sure. and keep doing the great work in New York. Yeah, um, I've been to New York a couple times. I remember back, I remember, I used to think Times Square was something like crazy, like, and so I went there and I was like, okay, it's, it's lights, it's buildings, it's, right. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's cool, but the, the way they hype it up, it's very like, I don't know, is, is, it, is Times Square overhyped? You know, <laughs> a lot of people would say, well, is New York overhyped? And, and, you know, it is, it's just a place. It's the idea. You know, it's, it's the, um, it, it's the possibilities that it presents to people. It's the uh, opportunities and, and the ability for somebody to be what they really want to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, New York. Yeah. That, it, so it's it's more you know it's not really about the place or the lights. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's just um, it's the idea. I, I really I really love that. You should put that like on a shirt or <laughs> on your <laughs> or as a caption. You never know because I love I love your captions. <laughs> sure. And Thank I, you. it should definitely you should definitely do one of those. So, so guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Everyday Stories. And so, Ravi, I hope you have an awesome day. I think it's what what time is over there? Uh, let's see. It is one thirty right now, and uh, six thirty four p.m. Yep. When I get done here, I'm going to um, gonna hop on a bicycle and drive down to uh, ride down to. Soho, the area, lower Manhattan, and <laughs> I'm going to go look for some more street unicorns. Mm, now that's for Robbie Quinn, we all know. So, <laughs> Robbie, have a great, great day. Really appreciate you once more. And so, we'll, um, anything like I said, let me know, and we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs>